we will be presenting some slides for today to walk you through um, the discussions and the topics for the day. Uh, just a very quick remark on uh, the virtual um, uh, refugee conference and the World Refugee Day. This actually uh, remarks the 20th anniversary for this um, World Refugee Day. It's been declared 20 years before, so we're happy to actually um, have it virtually during this um, time with all of our uh, partners and participants today. We can slide. Um, so again, all the um, uh, uh, remarks and the things we need to uh, remember for today about the recording, the chat function, the Q&A function, and please again feel free to change your name. Can slide. We'll talk a little bit about the agenda for today as well. So we will give you a little bit of a brief and an introduction on the remapping success. We'll be talking about empowerment initiatives for migrant women um, from all around the world. We, we have very exciting uh, dis discussions and initiatives from our partners to be discussed uh, today as well. We'll be welcoming our panelists. Uh, we'll, we'll have a, a round introduction. We'll be talking about the impact price, uh, which is something that we're very interested to announce in one of the sessions uh, throughout the day. Stay tuned for this and we'll um, have a special and dedicated thanks to Cap Gemini uh, for sponsoring this. Um, we have a highlight for the session. Please stay tuned to this part. It's a very special and a warm message um, uh, uh, from a person that uh, we are very delighted to, to have. Uh, we we'll, we we'll go to the topics of discussion um, with all of the attendees and the panelists taking your Q&A and remarks for the day at the end of the um, panel discussion. We can slide. So in this panel today, I'm, I'm sure you're asking uh, why we, we talked about remapping success and what does it basically mean? Uh, we, we're going to talk today about a few examples of the challenges and successful initiatives uh, for empowering women in making um, an impact and basically being more um, engaged in the employment uh, and the labor market, how we can basically develop their skills and support them to be more vocal um, in their community, especially um, in the, the special circumstances that they go through. Um, as Cairo, we are keen to support female refugee students on their path, pathways to better lives and um, digital solutions is basically one of that. Uh, we're so happy to discuss uh, the issues that, uh, that refugee women basically uh, face, um, uh, uh, considering that they are the most vulnerable and basically they make around 50% uh, of the whole vulnerable community of refugees. We want to discuss this issue and seek um, lessons uh, learned for us, for like-minded social enterprises and for labor market employers as well. We can slide. Uh, for our panelists today, we are very delighted and happy to have um, Anela Noor, the director of New Women Connectors and co-founder of uh, GERD WL. We have Anna Alvarez, the founder of Migration Hub as well. We're so happy to have her. Uh, we're having Sissy Tagendarf, the project management um, and the lead of the project management for diversity at, at Cap, in, uh, Cap Gemini in Germany. And we're so happy to have them. Thank you so much for hosting our Impact Prize today. We're going to talk more about it uh, uh, through, throughout the session. And I'm Hiba Dakhlala, the Jordan country representative at Kyron. We're going to have Rima Rashid as well. She's a working student uh, at Cap Gemini as well. We're going to have one of our very special students, Sajida, throughout the panel discussion as well. You can slide. Uh, so again, uh, we would like to, to talk a little bit uh, about the impact price. This is something that we wanted to highlight uh, during this session. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a unique thing for us because we decided to launch this impact price uh, during this conference to make it more engaged and, um, you know, talking more to our refugees, listening to them, knowing what kind of innovative solutions they have to elevate learning and to engage refugees in those innovative solutions. So the, this impact price was actually um, highlighting solutions that can leverage all of that. Uh, we, we are looking forward today to uh, announce the winner. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for the winner to actually have more visibility on the solution. Uh, they can connect with partners uh, and share their story 
with the global community. Please stay tuned for this at 6 p.m. Central European time. A very special uh, and dedicated thanks to Cap Gemini for actually supporting us in delivering this uh, to uh, uh, to the winner and actually mentoring um, the process of their solution and how can they empower themselves to actually make it uh, more visible uh, uh, in the future. Thank you so much. You can slide. Um, yeah. So, uh, Fabian, are we ready to go for next? Dear Refugee it's Conference participants, gender equality is not optional. It is a must. It is not only a fundamental human right, but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. Gender equality is one of the 17 sustainable development goals that all member countries of the United Nations have agreed upon in 2050. The SDGs, in short, are the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. To me, this leads to one simple and quite obvious conclusion. Girls and women must have the same rights as boys and men, and they must be given the same opportunities. They need to have the same access to education, to schools and universities, or a professional training. As I believe, education is the key to a better life, a self-determined life. Knowledge makes you self-confident and powerful. Why should girls and women be deprived from this option? Exactly, there's no reason for them to miss out. And it's every country's and every society's and each and everyone's responsibility to give them their equal rights. As patroness of UNICEF Germany, I've witnessed what a difference education makes most recently this year in Nepal. I met such strong girls there, most of them being the first girls in their respective families to go to school. And it made them so self-confident and also ambitious. They have dreams but also aspirations and clear goals. And this is the first step to an independent life. So I've seen positive examples and progress. And in fact, over the past decades, there has been progress in different areas of life and in many parts of the world. More girls are going to school and fewer girls are forced into early marriage. More women are serving in parliament and are taking on positions of leadership. Laws are being reformed to advance gender equality. So, despite the fact that there is really still a lot to do, we are on the right track. We need to keep on walking along the path of education as our most powerful tool. Education is critical for women's and girls' health and well-being as well as their income generation opportunities and participation in the formal labor market. It is also critical that they keep up with the rapid te technological and digital transformations that are affecting jobs in all areas. It is one of my major concerns that women will be left behind in the process of digitalization. We need to keep up here and be an active part of the process. This is why I really appreciate Kiron's work it combines education with the digital aspects of life and it offers digital education for displaced people in various countries in order to qualify for university studies. No one, neither man nor woman, should be deprived of the opportunity to study and to attain a university degree just because he or she had to escape from his country due to war or other crisis. But as the reality shows, it's especially difficult for displaced women to get back into the educational system once they left their home country. For women, it is absolutely crucial to collaborate and to support each other. And that is why I value this virtual refugee conference Amplify Now, organized by Kiro, so highly. It is a great place to do exactly that. It provides an important platform for refugees and organizations to collaborate on existing solutions and learnings, as well as connect with other stakeholders in this field to provide more learning opportunities for refugee women worldwide. 
We need to understand the unique challenges of women, find and share ways to bridge the gaps and make this society more inclusive for all women around the world. I wish you a fruitful exchanges and a lot of inspirations and motivation to fight for the right to live a happy and fulfilled life. You yourself can make a difference as you are becoming the role models for all the young women following you. I admire you and wish you lots of strength and success along your way to the top. Go for it and thank you for being here today. This was a very um, special message uh, from the First Lady of Germany. We're very delighted to have her actually from all Kyron family and team and all of our participants. Uh, thank you very, very much, um, Elke Budenbender. Uh, this was very special and we're looking forward to having a very fruitful discussion today. And this was a very special message for all of us uh, and all of uh, our students and Kyron. Um, following up to this uh, very special video and very warm uh, welcome, we would like to go to our um, topics uh, of discussion. And um, we can slide to the uh, next one. Uh, maybe we can start a little bit uh, with you, Anna, and talking about the uh, migrant entrepreneurship perspective. We would like to hear more from you on the German and, and South American perspective, maybe. And um, uh, how, how can you walk us through the challenges and the innovative uh, projects and solutions you've been uh, working on in the last period? Please. Well, thank you so much to every, for everybody for the invitation and, and to bring it up such an important topic, especially um, to give the space to talk about women because in, um, you know, migrants in general, everybody has a different scale of vulnerability and women are always on the bottom. Um, so it's really important that, uh, that we discuss this and, and then we create and think uh, most importantly how do we how do we move forward? So from from my end, actually, as a uh, from my migration hub uh, point of view, ever since 2016, we've been studying uh, the topic of migrant entrepreneurship, uh, particularly because um, it was really interesting back in 2015 when projects like Migration Hub, like Chiron, and many of the other great initiatives came 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 to life. Um, there were already initiatives run and led by migrants themselves, and I myself had to take over the project and found migration and, and found migration hub as an, as an organization. And I myself encountered a lot of um, a lot of difficulties, not only to create a project from from scratch that everybody goes through, but also for being a migrant. And on top of that, for being a woman, actually, I, I, I mean throughout my my entrepreneurial path of the last four years sometimes i i wonder what was more difficult or when the times that i struggled the most was it because i was a migrant or was it because i was a woman um so so that actually allowed us to start understanding the topic particularly right now that there are so many programs on refugee entrepreneurship um, not only in europe but also it's starting to increase the interest in other countries in latin america i will get back to that but it's really important then that we learn the lessons and then we studied basically what we that we share basically what we have learned through throughout these years um basically the things that work the things that do not work and how can we really move forward and provide and how can we help? So, um, so let me start by sharing uh, with with you all, basically what um, the things that we already know, right? I mean, this is not this is not a secret. I mean, uh, people who come from different countries and especially refugees, due to resilience, it's most likely that that um, that migrants and refugees are more entrepreneurial. Uh, particularly because they're seeking for jobs and opportunities. And most of the times there are no uh, positions available for everybody. So many jump into entrepreneurship as an option to basically create and make a living. But also really important talking about migrants and women with vulnerable backgrounds. Um, we also have women who are not necessarily recognized as refugees um, with refugee status, but are women that are migrants in vulnerable situations like women trafficked. Uh, for them, for example, uh, creating programs, and, and I have witnessed some of the existing programs um, that actually also create a self and create empowerment towards women. So there's no doubt that entrepreneurship can really play the role of empowerment 
can play the role of creating a new livelihood for, for refugees. And most, um, most important, basically, that gives back to the, to the host economy, right? Because by creating new ventures, you create new job opportunities for other people and also innovation in, in the host country. So there's no doubt that there's many, many, um, uh, many great uh, outcomes out of uh, promoting entrepreneurship, especially among refugees and among um, uh, migrant uh, um, um, people with migrant background. But also it's really important that we understand what are the things that are happening that we're not providing this. Now, um, refugee entrepreneurship, migrant entrepreneurship, it's not new. I mean, we have countries, um, for example, United States, I mean, Silicon Valley was technically built by migrants. I mean, brands and, and great technology that we know today wouldn't have been able without migrants. I mean, the co-founder of Google was a political refugee. Uh, we wouldn't have Uber, we wouldn't have Tesla, we wouldn't have um, Skype, for example. I mean, all different um, mindsets of people coming from abroad, creating innovation and really breakthrough innovation. But um, in Germany, for instance, something that we learned is that Germany does have a unique opportunity and, and have a moment and has a momentum in building innovation while bringing opportunities to, to small initiatives and to, to thrive, but, but also to promote um, basically innovation in established already ventures. Now, in a migration hub in the past hosted uh, programs for migrant entrepreneurs, um, which mostly was attended by people with, with, with refugee status, especially because in Germany, people with refugee status are allowed to work and also to create ventures. So that's a, that's a great tool and that's a great opportunity for, for many. So, um, so we learned, which is, which is the sad part, 50% of our participants were taking the program because, um, because they couldn't find a job. So that that's a mean that entrepreneurship is for everybody. So when we create programs that, um, let's say, promote entrepreneurship, it's really important that we take into account that many people are doing this and many of the refugees and people with refugee background or migrant background in general are doing this because they don't have an option. So why it is important to understand that? Because becoming an entrepreneur, it's really hard. And unfortunately, the systems that we have in place only benefit those who have a system and a, uh, and a backup, whether for locals, you can access to finance, you can go to get loans to build your own ventures, whereas for migrants, it's impossible. We don't even have a credit uh, history here. We are not being able to, to build our lives. We might not have family related. We do not have access to networks. So it is really vulnerable, all the situations that we need to analyze before creating programs. Why? Because 50% of our participants, if they wouldn't have gotten a job, they would drop the program or would drop the venture that they were creating. So. Um, um, so at the end of the day, something that we also learned through the participants and through, you know, all the journey of getting to know so many migrant entrepreneurs around the world, the vulnerability of many of them not having the access to finances to really make the work can lead to, um, to problems within, within, the, within, within the companies. Um, we can actually force people to go into legal troubles because there's no other way to get rescue in terms of finances, also for the lack of network and the lack of access to, to, to a banking system that can really back up um, people with migrant background. Many migrants don't even have the access, for example, to, to open a bank account, for example. So there's so many things that we really need to go thorough and to fix in the system to create a real program and opportunities um, for migrants who are becoming entrepreneurs. Interestingly, um, migrants in Germany are building microeconomy ventures, which is something that we need to call the attention that most of the programs that are existing for migrant entrepreneurs are run by NGOs, which there's nothing wrong with this. I think that NGOs plays an important part in the, in the ecosystem because we have the networks, we have the know-how to basically do this companionship to the entrepreneurs, but at the same time, we need to partner up and sometimes we need to let 
um, or existing accelerators from private uh, companies that can really interact and they can really bring these programs to life. Why? Because they have experience. And at the end of the day, we should not be treating migrants differently or we should not be clapping for a refugee who created um, a venture just because he's a refugee. No, we need to treat people as with because there's a business idea, because there's a business model, because the risk of failure is really high in general. So yes. we cannot provide and we cannot put refugees in a much more vulnerable or migrants in a much more vulnerable situation than they actually are. So okay. the other part and the other important part of also partnering up with accelerators and existing accelerators coming from companies is because migrants are expected to innovate. And if right now, most of the people building entrepreneurship in Germany, it's microeconomy, which is great because that actually says and responds to what I said at the beginning, people are doing it to make a living. So the and last thing that everybody is thinking on is how do we innovate or how do we change the German system? But at the same time, Germany has an opportunity to invest in creating and using the mindset of entrepreneurs or migrants basically to create breakthrough innovative solutions, which we haven't seen um, yet. Yeah. Um, on the I, know, I, need, I, need, I need to, to cut you just a it. little bit. Here <laughs> We have a lot of very insightful uh, ideas and, and experiences, I would say, and I totally understand and relate to, to what you can say. We can uh, maybe uh, emphasize more later. as we can talk also about the blended uh, approach in the MENA region and in, in, in Jordan. Uh, I would like just to go a little bit um, to the uh, internal initiatives uh, also at uh, Cap, uh, Cap Gemini and get back to you at a later stage and see about the Q&A from our participants. So maybe um, Sissy and uh, Reem, if you can hear us well now, you can tell us more about the internal initiatives at uh, Cap Gemini and the four phases of the female employee at your organization. How do you do this? And uh, what is basically the norm? You can tell us more about uh, your initiatives. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Heba. You're going to show the um, presentation or the, the slide? Um, I, I think if Louise can, yes. Okay. So thank you very much. In the meantime, um, you know, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I think um, Reem has not joined yet. So uh, maybe she, she managed to join in while we um, sort of, you know, go into the discussion. And um, I think she's uh, got... I'm online. CC, I'm online, yeah. Ah, okay. So I didn't see you yeah. on the video. Yeah. Hi. So I'm happy to, to have you here, Reem. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Yeah, we managed uh, that day. Okay, so I can see you now. <laughs> yeah, so, that's great. So Reem is um, um, one of my Capgemini colleagues. I'm um, the lead of diversity, diversity management and projects and uh, mainly uh, responsible for um, integration of refugees uh, actually and for, you know, developing of women within the company. So uh, first, I think what's quite important, uh, the initiatives um, we might see in a couple of uh, seconds now, they are not only for refugees, women, of course, because we do not, um, you know, make a difference between refugees, women, and um, German women or British women, or you know, we are multicultural um, companies. So obviously, there are so many um, people with with us. So it's you know, it doesn't make not any difference. But anyhow, um, twenty fifteen we started with the initiative Refugees at Capgemini project. So we. Um, hired um, refugees for Capgemini. It's uh, more than 100, 120 colleagues now. And um, so just to see um, maybe some initiatives, um, what we do especially for women. Um, Heba, are you going to show in the slide or do you want me just to, yeah, to maybe go Yeah, we can go through the discussion, yeah. Okay, so we decided the four phases of a female employee's life cycle. Um, obviously, it's the same, like, or more or less the same like the uh, male's life cycle, but normally, you know, women um, go for um, parental leave. Um, of course, men do it as well, but no. Anyhow, so we start with the recruiting. Um, woman, she says, 
well, I want to be attracted by my employer of choice. So what, what, what the thing we do is um, we you know, are very active in external networks. We are very active in high coverage in the media. And what I especially do is I try to raise the visibility of women in, on websites and uh, uh, the media. Yeah. So this is very important that um, because we think if she sees it, she can be it. So if, you know, the, the people outside or the females outside see that there are many females um, who really have geminal. So it's, um, you know, for, for her, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, very important to see, oh, I can develop the Hilkap Gemini. So, for example, we, we launched tech workshops for women um, last Christine, year in December in Berlin. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, so let me go. Okay. Yes. So, um, hang on. I just have to close the window because now here I'm in Munich and there's a weather. It's raining down uh, dogs. Hang on a second. <laughs> Okay, sorry for that. So you can slide now, uh, so we can hang on. What we do is um, we raise tech workshops for women. So um, all of our colleagues, um, you know, they, they try to explain what they do the whole day, like a business analyst or software engineer or SRP consultant. So we invite um, women, refugee women or German women or Spanish women or whatever, whatever uh, the more colorful, the better. So, and we show them what, how, how it's the work in tech. How, how does it look like? Yeah. So anyhow, if we go, go further, uh, when we do the onboarding, um, the, the colleagues say, well, I want to get onboarded and I want to get in touch with internal networks. So, for example, we've got a large network uh, called um, Women at Capgemini. And so what I try is to gather all uh, the new women together and say, look, there is our network. You know, go, go and get some information there, how you can get on board with Capgemini, what is the important, um, what is, you know, who is important for you, um, you know, uh, who can help you. So this is very important to get all the new colleagues um, into internal networks. For example, again, the welcome days, um, I always, uh, I'm a host of the round table, for example, where I um, introduce developing initiatives for women and work-life balance. This is very important. And I also gather them together in the uh, network women at Capgemini. So this is a very, very concrete action to, you know, to get all the new female colleagues um, properly onboarded. The next thing, when uh, when I want to the third stage stage of the life cycle here is the developing. How can we develop women, um, though they go into parental leave or you know when they want to you know go further in their career? Um, we have set a few uh, mentoring programs like um, Inspire to Lead. It's a mentoring program where um, the tandems are from young women they you know go together with a, a very experienced and um, senior colleague where they you know talk once or twice a month uh, for six to nine months so this is very uh, a very very um, fruitful um, mentoring program and also um, you know strengthen the internal networks um, skill workshops and training especially for women um, network women at Capgemini again then we launched a women's net networking event so all the women from one branch we have uh, 13 branches in, in Germany all the women get together they have a technical um, experience the uh, technical sessions and there is a Q and A afterwards, so two or three hours, and they have a not little lunch or supper, or supper so then they call, uh, you know can get in touch together. We also it extended the professional leadership trainings um, with the topic developing women because we think sometimes um, you have to. Um, raise awareness that sometimes women want to be de de developed in a, another way than men, because they need 
maybe they need some more support because they are on parental leave, for example. And what we do is we offer e-learnings and webinars um, when they are on parental leave. And when you know we gather them together in, in um, we, uh, webinars or we invite them to you know to join a women's net event. Yeah, so this is we try to to be uh, in touch very close um, when our women or men as well are on on parenting leave. So what else on the first uh, the fourth um, you know pillar in, it's a retain. So how can we make sure that we do not lose women? Um, Childcare and parenting leaves. We try to reintegrate after um, absence. Yeah, we, we launched a um, you know absence programs called fair welcome. So you know that we say goodbye and then we you know try to get them back as soon as possible. Um, as we offer very very flexible work models, and we have the working from home or home office. Um, you know now. Uh, any in, in Corona, COVID-19 times, uh, anyhow. So, and um, what I think it's very, uh, very, very works very well is the employee assistance service, where um, our employees can ring and say, "Well, I need to uh, have a, a kindergarten, and I need to, um, to have some support in the household, and I need to have support in the, you know, home and elderly care context." And there's also a crisis hotline, a 24 hours uh, crisis hotline, where you can get instant support when everything's too much. So these are just some examples for um, recruit and onboarding and developing and retain. So um, maybe it's it might be a good idea if uh, yeah. if you just uh, maybe you can have experienced um, you know one or the other you know initiative and maybe you want to um, you know tell us something about your perspective as a That's working true. student. I think yeah, sure. So um, I'm Reims. Um, I came. To, I'm from Syria. I came to Germany uh, in 2013, and I started studying at the university in 2014. And uh, I'm, I was studying computer science at the Free University Berlin. And as a female and a non-German speaker, uh, it was really difficult to get along at the university and um, there were so many few women i would say only three or two four in the whole university in the in the all the faculty in the all the faculty and so i was really facing so many difficulties in in, in from this perspective and then i started to do an internship at cup gemini and there i was facing the opposite experience so as this is already as you mentioned we have so many encouraging and uh, um, we have like many opportunity and encouraging programs at Capgemini. But more for more about that, the ambience as itself is really good. So um, we would, I didn't feel um, strange as I felt at the university as women studying computer science. Um, it's it's the ambience, it's the colleagues, everything uh, really plays a role in this um, in my journey. So we didn't have um, um, I didn't really feel different. So I would see I would say the friendly uh, ambience was really important for me. I felt um, good when I was working, and. Kidding. So that's uh, yeah, that's for the ambience I would say. So that was my two different experience at the university and at work. So that was uh, for me really important because yeah, you know, you want to feel well where, when working. You want to feel home while working. You spend so many times. And um, I would say then after doing my internship, I decided yeah, I really feel good here. Um, I work. I like working here. It's we have lots of fun. And then I applied for a working student uh, position. And since 2016 till now, like it means four years, I'm working as working student. And um, I would say, yeah, we have these meetings, like I think every month or every two months for women. And we really oh. get um, 
stream I really this networking video. yeah Sorry, can you hear me yeah sure Thank you so much for uh, joining us. I'm so happy you can hear us as well. Thank you for sharing the experience. I would only ask you to, to give me a remark on your experience with Cap Gemini before we head to the next topic uh, because of our limited time. So if you can just give me a okay. quote or a remark of your experience, that would be perfect. Um, could you be more precisely? <laughs> I would say just the most important thing about your experience with um, Cap Gemini as a working student with them until now. Uh, um, something that you might yeah. want to reflect to the Impact Prize winner for today. Yeah, I would say that we have, um, like, I like working in the Cap Gemini because we have really different uh, up, uh, projects and it's really. Um, they were really addressed what the person, like the student, would like to work. Yeah. So we would. Uh, it would the interest of the person really play an important role, and then in the to in the, the second thing is that it's really good that it's f flexible, so mm -hmm. you can really decide your time working time. You can um, decide when your holidays. You can take off time when you have exams. So it's really um, adjusting to your students. They really um, understand the concept of student and put your studies uh, at the first priority. Yeah. And third thing, we are really helpful, Ampion. So everyone helps each other, teach each other. And so yeah, so I'm not afraid to ask. Thank you very much, Srim. We are very delighted to have you and to hear more about your experience. I would like to, to go to our uh, next topic uh, with Anala. How, how can we talk about the uh, participatory uh, methods and uh, ensuring that women voices are really part of the creation process? We talked about innovation solutions today. We talked about initiatives, uh, challenges, but can you walk us through more um, on how women are basically engaged in this process? Okay. How Thank do you. we hear what they need? Um, I would be so happy to hear more from you. Yes, thank you, Hiba. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. And I'm also very pleased to be as a, a co-organizer for the co-creator of this platform because we, as a refugee and migrant leaders, we believe all discussion should be led by refugee and migrant women, especially. Uh, and that's what we are doing at New Women Connectors because we all are uh, refugee and migrant women. And we are not only uh, creating a platform for other refugee and migrant women to discuss about uh, their problems, but also bring the solution how they want uh, to solve their problems uh, about their lives, which better to them. I will, uh, you know, uh, give you an example uh, why we created about New Women Connectors, because coming from a developing country, uh, coming from uh, uh, from as such as uh, societies or culture where no one asks a refugee or migrant woman when they are living in their home what they you want to do, and their perception is like they are burdened, they are uh, just has to get married, and they can't contribute to the uh, uh, better lives of uh, their homes and their societies and their countries. We found it similar uh, perception. Uh, still exist in even in the Europe, uh, which, which is uh, a developed uh, uh, part of uh, developed countries. And when we saw, no one is asking them what you want to do, and they are just pushing them, and giving them uh, very limited options to work with. That's the reason we created New Woman Connector, where we are trying to give a platform where they come with their own lens. Uh, which, uh, as in the start of the beginning, we hear from the uh, first lady, she was saying gender equality really matters for everyone. That's what we are saying. In the, if we take the gender mainstreaming and it, it uh, towards the to tools of gender mainstreaming, it's important to give them a voice so they can share their perspective because their voice is is not only for telling their stories, but the voice as new woman connector, we are taking them as a highlighting, as the indicators at the gaps of the system, which is not providing according to them, which can help them, which can amplify them, which can make them more strong, which can provide them access to, access to the opportunity. That's what we are trying to do at new woman connector. And recently we have launched because uh, of COVID, everything is changed. So uh, we launched our uh, project called Re uh, Leading Resilience, where we are giving uh, again refugee and migrant women 
specifically in the Europe, uh, uh, because uh, uh, Europe uh, is a hub of digitalization. It's a digital era. So we are giving this platform where all refugee and migrant women come and they, they are sharing and highlighting the gaps which they are uh, living in uh, uh, already, lack of uh, facilitation and how they want to be integrated. And these tools which we are talking about education and uh, access to the opportunity and the labor market and even being a woman is different. It does not mean they are inferior. That's what we are trying to show them and taking them they are resilient, they are not vulnerable and their empowerment, they already have, we are true believer at New Woman Connector, they are true um, holder of the resilient, they just need a visibility and that's what we are trying to do at New Woman Connector and we are linking their resilience, their voices, their lived experience as a valid knowledge to the policymaker. That's what we are trying to do to give their feedback and their suggestion uh, to link with uh, directly to the uh, gender strategies of, of European Commission. And that's where we are trying to give them the voice because if you see here, what is not letting them to grow is the policies. Instead of helping them, it's so unfortunate. These policy are not understanding their problems and there's lack of uh, 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 platform where they come and share their uh, uh, involvement and share their ways to grow and I'm so happy to have this platform here and we are showing how much we are resilient, how much we are powerful. We just need more tools, more better so we can um, uh, create uh, a home which is our um, a new home in living in our whole societies. And I'm so happy when I was hearing uh, Rim and Anna's uh, point of view and that's what we are saying because there's lack of visibility of all this initiative and everything because of due to capitalism or due to patriarchal system, we still are fighting for the gender gap even in, in the either it's a, uh, a daily wage, page, wages or um, uh, other, uh, other platform. And we are being a woman. I always, uh, because I'm from Pakistan and in Pakistan, uh, I was uh, fighting to have a more opportunity for the education and more uh, opportunity how I can be a more entrepreneur and how I can be a more expert. And I, again, expert. And again, in Europe, I'm feeling there's again, lack of opportunities. And that's what we are trying to do, giving access to the opportunity to all the refugee and migrant women who are living here. And we are trying to show like enough is enough. We, we can't wait for more, all the uh, world to be equal. It's, it's, it's a long way to go. And even this pandemic um, is a, really an opportunity and we are taking this uh, pandemic as a tunnel after this tunnel on the that side we are thinking to take it as a new future where mm -hmm. we'll be just an equality for everyone so i really like and invite you all everyone to be connect us because as a connector we believe we need to be connect and to show a visibility led by refugee and migrant women we are as a leader so thank you so much. And I'm looking forward for having a more question from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anila. That was an eye opening, I would say. And uh, one of the things maybe that captured me and uh, uh, would lead me to, to the next uh, topic we're talking about uh, for Jordan is basically sometimes you're struggling for basic needs, uh, for basic rights like education and access to safe spaces, um, access to uh, mandatory uh, services, we would say. Uh, one of the, the, the topics uh, that we would like to discuss and talk about uh, as well is the blended uh, learning uh, approach that we've been doing in Jordan and Lebanon as well in the last period. Um, it's been ongoing for Kairon in, in host communities and in camp-based uh, communities as well. Um, uh, the participatory uh, method was one of the things we uh, always depend on hearing from our students uh, what they basically need, what kind of skills, what kind of things that can really empower them in uh, being better people, more professional, more skilled, getting better jobs, um, how they can really go to the next phase. Um, I mean, um, it, it's always good. One of the questions that we have in the Q&A is, um, is mind opening as well that some of the women uh, that needs, need, need to be heard basically are not uh, because of a lot of uh, circumstances uh, sometimes. They can't go to conferences or meetings or 
so on where they can be really heard. So this is where we stand, uh, where we try to get as much as possible of information from our students in camps or host communities um, or whatever we can uh, find their voices to amplify them as we're trying to do today. Um, so one of the approaches, uh, as I was saying, is the blended learning approach. It's something that Karen has been doing in the last period and trying to actually empower refugees to gain more skills that empower them to enroll in the labor market. One of the um, examples that we have is basically in Zatari camp in Jordan, in which we have a couple of uh, programs with UNHCR and um, a number of implementing partners with them as well. We've heard a lot from students that they need a lot of skills so they can basically work with humanitarian actors within the camp uh, or basically in host communities. Um, uh, we've been working uh, really hard on, on getting um, what we can of courses and skills and trainings, uh, whether it's an online or uh, in an offline approach to actually empower them with enough skills for them to actually gain some um, uh, employment opportunities at the camp. Um, uh, the, we've heard many uh, positive feedbacks from the students, um, even though it's a small English course or a small Arabic course about the basics of the humanitarian education. Um, even if it's really small, sometimes it makes a huge difference for them in their lives. Um, and in host communities, it's basically the same case, but I would say refugees, and especially in Jordan, host communities are um, open to more opportunities than those uh, at the camp. So we're trying to, to uh, give equal opportunities on, uh, on all sides uh, and actually, you know, um, hearing from them what they uh, need more um, to, to be more qualified to the labor market. Um, uh, um, I, I think we have a lot of um, insights and ideas uh, to share as well um, during maybe other uh, sessions. Uh, again, I would encourage everyone to uh, join the other sessions because one of the questions was um, about that. You can uh, search the Virtual Refugee Conference uh, program uh, online and you can see all of the other sessions and the links to that one. Um, uh, I have a lot of ideas and a lot of things to share. You you actually uh, made an eye-opening uh, discussions today, ladies. Thank you so much for that. Um, I would just um, go for a very quick uh, look maybe at the Q&A for us to see uh, what we have in there and maybe a couple of uh, remarks for our female students uh, and all the refugees uh, hearing us today and, and maybe a small quote from all of us. Um, so maybe I would... Um, ask this question uh, very quick to um, Anila and please feel free every, everyone to, to actually do so from uh, Mohammed um, Aydin. Uh, he was talking about a study that uh, he made recently and he was noticing that women, um, uh, 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 he's referring to them as being at the bottom. Um, I guess he's referring to people who are not uh, exposed to opportunities, as I said, like events or conferences or so on um, due to different barriers. Maybe language is one of them. Um, and he was asking how they can be encouraged to be more uh, engaged uh, and more heard, let's say, and um, uh, so, so we can be um, amplifying them more so we can hear their voices more. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah please Thank you, Hiba, for and Mohammed for this question. I think that's what we are trying to do because we know uh, there is a lack of uh, encouragement, there is a lack of uh, visibility, and there is a lack of role models. So that's what uh, we are trying to give and bringing all the role models, and they come and uh, share their own struggle, share their own gaps, and how they deal with those struggles and those gaps and these uh, refugee and migrant women who are uh, stuck uh, in the system or in the cultural barrier and uh, we are trying to give them uh, a encouragement like you are not alone we are mm -hmm. here if we can do it you can also do it and we are here to help you how we can grow together and how we can uh, cross these all barriers so i think that important thing is creating a more and more relevant role models. So if I see, I can uh, easily reflect, oh, she's like me. If I'm a mother, if uh, I, I am, she can do it, and then I can also do it. But also, uh, we can also provide them resources. We can also need to provide them more uh, techniques and upskillings they need. And we also uh, hear one thing I really, really want to stress is to change the narratives 
to change the stereotypical things which is going on, uh, which is linked uh, somehow as a stigma of refugee and migrant women, especially in Europe. And we are trying to challenge them and bringing new role models and new framing. We are resilient. We are not vulnerable. That's how we can achieve it. Thank you. Ima, I also would like to jump in on, on the on, on the remark that Mohammed did, which I, I find it very, uh, very, very important to discuss here. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's it's really important that we don't only create these role models. This is really this is really important and vital. But something that I have seen in Europe, and, and I really would like to apologize that I didn't weigh in that much on, on Latin America, which is my region and, and where I received actually a study and my whole career is from. Um, something that I have observed in Europe uh, um, ever since 2015, when Europe had to deal with, with the so-called refugee crisis, is that not many refugees and migrants were leading projects. So it's not about only creating role models for the sake of, you know, creating great stories as, uh, and, and I know that Anila shares this with me, it's about empowering them to take over the projects. So something that we have to do and to recognize is that many of the projects that exist, we need to go hand on hand together. If we are working with migrants, then it should not be for migrants. So it should be locals together with migrants working in the same level of leadership. I'm also a chair of different, I mean, another um, NGO that it, uh, a chair of the board of an NGO that it's founded by, um, by, a, by a Somali refugee. Um, and basically my job is to empower her. My job is to make her the director and my job is to basically support that she does the job. Because at the end of the day, well, in my case, of course, after four years, I know very well the system where I'm in. I mean, based in Germany, and 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 there's a lot of things to tackle that, of course, many migrants are afraid of when when it comes to develop their own organizations and trying to empower other women. So it is important that many of us understand the role that sometimes we don't have to lead. We need to facilitate for those who have the voice and those who can really empower other women to take on the stage and not only the stage of, of, of speaking, but to do the, gr the, the groundwork. And that's something that we all have to be very much more humble, especially when it comes to leading organizations and to give the spot to the migrant and especially women when it comes to empower women. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna. And this also leads me to the second question on the Q&A that is very much related to this one, but we were talking maybe about uh, the part where we encourage women to actually take part and be vocal about what they need, but most importantly as well um, is, is basically encouraging them to believe in their capacities that they can be actually part uh, and inf influence in the social environment, that they can be entrepreneurs. I mean, sometimes we see this um, perception uh, of them telling themselves that they can't be creative, that they can't create enough. Um, uh, uh, this is also a question from Aisha. She's asking, what are some recommendations to encourage women to shift their perception and understand that they have uh, the capacities uh, actually to influence their social environment. Um, I mean, maybe we, we might uh, already answered some of this uh, in the participation part, but it's also important to encourage them maybe uh, or, or to have some recommendations on how to encourage them to be uh, a part of this uh, social environment and how they can be uh, entrepreneurs in their environments or communities as well. Um, maybe I can jump in there because uh, yes, I believe um, or to well to yeah to believe in your my own capacity I mean I think it, it would help to um, you know to look on the uh, role model uh, on a role model basis or mentor mentorship basis I we experienced so many good um, results from um, offering a mentoring that you really um, get someone experienced to uh, the younger women who do not believe in their capacity. So, I mean, it's a bit of a work to organize all this, but once the mentorship uh, or the tandem has been settled, both of them, they work, you know, separately together. And I think um, sometimes there's some, so, so much eye-opening within the mentorship. That's what they, uh, the, couple, uh, the attendants reported to me. And they, they are much stronger and they have much more self-confidence after the mentorship. So maybe um, it's a good idea to, um, I think Ayesha um, asked this because, you know, that uh, Ayesha, maybe you can just try to get some experienced senior women 
ask them if they want to um, be mentor, female mentor, and then uh, offer them to uh, younger and insecure women. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also have a question from uh, Jay uh, on uh, asking us if we have any ideas to how recent immigrants and refugee students are accessing healthcare services, especially mental health resources in the context of Jordan or uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, yeah. I don't know who's, who's going to answer that, but but of course it it varies from every country. I have, gotcha. I mean, yes, it's it's way different, and and I think it's a great question. But at least I have to say that um, most of the times that happens is that um, since we tend to create a lot of projects that are not necessarily done uh, on the need of the migrants or on the shoes from the migrants, most mostly um, what I have seen is that mostly women don't know where to go or who to access uh, or, or where to ask for help. At least Germany has uh, tons of uh, non-profits actually in our, in our database. We count 511 organizations um, that are available throughout Germany basically to work with, with migrants and, and refugees. Um, so there are plenty of sources for women to access for mental health if it's not directly from the health insurance. Once you are a refugee, once you are um, uh, you, you got grant, you get granted a refugee status. You have access to health insurance as everybody else, and it's quite good actually in Germany. But sometimes it's a matter of explaining, and that's also something that from Migration Hub we try to work with companies as well and with and with uh, governmental institutions to try to kind of guide them to understand how, how important it is to bring the information. It's not to dedicate much more time, but actually put on the shoes of somebody who comes from outside and don't know how the system works. Um, and just basically to make sure that people understand where to access, where is a local already know because I mean they were born in the system. So it's just a matter sometimes on 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 being more user based and more need based to try to to guide. Unfortunately, that's not the, the same reality in many countries uh, with access yes. to. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, quickly. I just uh, refer again to our own uh, work, uh, working which we are uh, doing in uh, Europe. We have uh, created a WhatsApp group because, as Anna said, I totally agree, every situation is different, especially for refugee and migrant women who do not speak different uh, language. So we are trying to help them uh, according to their um, language, mother language tongue. So we uh, have created a WhatsApp group in more than uh, eight languages, like Dari, Pashto, uh, Arabic, Spanish, uh, English, and giving them already valid information, like from um, World Health Organization and some uh, um, uh, mental uh, session uh, we are providing by uh, our uh, uh, part Partner, we are one uh, but the thing is that again they, when there's too much information is is again becomes like which information relevant to us so that's what we are trying and giving them through whatsapp groups the uh, 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 help and support and mentoring how we can help each other and how we can stay we all are together in this no one is alone yeah uh, i i need to say thank you all ladies it, it was uh, such a pleasure talking to you today and uh, touching upon all of those topics um, I would say I, I really wish that everyone enjoyed the session and we're so happy to encourage you to go again to the Virtual Refugee Conference website and check all of the other sessions. A very special thanks again to um, Ms. Elke who shared with us the very special video to the participants, all of your questions. Uh, if we haven't touched on all of the questions, we'll have a follow-up um, learning outcome on the session and we'll answer all your questions. You can, um, uh, see it in the uh, feedback and follow up and yeah again thank you so much for sharing this with us um, uh, we would like to send a very special uh, thanks and gratitude to all the uh, women and especially refugees internally displaced displaced people and people having a lot of uh, troubles and struggling to actually access uh, education protection and the mandatory services um, we are with you. This day is to actually to remember this, to, to remember what you're going through. And we're all in this together, supporting this um, as much as we can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ivan, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.